presence of the Lord is here. So I just wanted to greet and welcome everybody. Thank you so much. We know that um, due to COVID, uh, we have not been able to gather as a church at nighttime, which was our usual, uh, you know, standard operating procedure. <laughs> and we've been out of that for about two years, almost three going on now. And so to be able to sit here on a Sunday night with all of you um, and me not, you know, be on the other side of the aisle <laughs> is uh, rather amazing. And it's great to be looking at you all tonight. So welcome and happy Black History Month. Um, Yes, it is a celebration of all things black. <laughs> that's all the thing. That's the all thing. Any and everything. When you think about, when you think about the diaspora, when you think about um, us as a group of people, our culture, our language, our food, our music is so. Um, it's so intuitive. It's spiritual in nature. It, it carries something that no other culture. Um, can testify to and so for us to be sitting here in tandem with the rest of the nation celebrating Black History Month um, is very very special for especially for 2022 considering the last two years that we've had it's amazing to be able to sit and celebrate this month as black people of the diaspora so um, with that being said, this month, the national theme for Black uh, History Month is health and wellness. Um, for me, it's a blessing to be healthy enough and well enough to even be part of the programming for this year. Um, I think we can all um, testify to either personal illness or illnesses in our um, families or just our community, right? That some overcame and some did not, unfortunately. They say, succumbed to their illnesses. And so it's a very fitting theme this year to have it be health and wellness for the black community. So, um, yeah. So of course, in order to open up this night, we, uh, we need to be able to just thank the Most High, the Lord, for all of his blessings, his mercy, his graciousness, um, albeit not deserved. He um, lends that to us every day and every minute of every day. And so to um, take us to the throne, none other than our um, prayer warrior, uh, Deacon um, Bahari. I would like to have you come up. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Isn't it lovely to be in the house of the Lord on a Sunday night? Amen. There is something different about it, yeah? There's a, there's a different, something in the atmosphere that feels so different, and it, it's wonderful. Praise the Lord. Can you stand with us, please, with me, please, as we go to the throne? Heavenly Father, we just continue to praise you, continue to honor and adore you. Continue, Lord, to give you thanks and praise for taking us through this day. Father God, you've fed us with your word this morning, Father God, and we are so grateful, not only for your word, but Father God, to be able to participate in the Holy Communion, Father God, which you have set a standard for us to do, Father God. Oh, it's such a privilege. Lord, we do not take it for granted, and we thank you. We thank you. We thank you that your mind are always upon us. Your eyes are upon us, Father God. Not just one, but all of us, all at the same time. And just, just show us what a powerful and mighty God that you are. And Lord, all that we come to do tonight, we know you are here. And we ask that you take full control, Father God. Lord, we are mindful, Lord, that the history that you have left us in your word. And as you brought us into the New Testament, so it is, Father God, if we do not know our past, how can we know our present and our future? So, Father God, as we come to hear more about our past, Father God, and not only that, but as a, I'm going to use the word black because 
there was black when you walked the word, they, they walked this land because of Father God, the, the, the temperature of the land, the heat, and our skin represents where we are from, Father God. So we know you, you've walked those lands, Father God, for us, your people. And as you continue to free us in you, Father God, the, the, we ask that tonight, Father God, that you will open up our understanding to that which we will learn more about us and how best we can equip ourselves for the things that become us in sickness, Father God, in diseases, Lord, in mental illness, Father God, Lord, we just deliver ourselves in your hand and say, Lord, have your way. Teach us as only you can, and we give you thanks in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I don't know anybody else who can pray like Deacon Bahari. I don't know if you all do, but I don't. Um, I wanted to take, before we go into our... Um, song for the night which will be our um song for our opening song for every night i i'm sure you guys can guess which song that might be um the one quiz you have do not feel it there's only one song that could be our opening song for black history month right but i do want to take some time to thank everyone who was a participant a contributor uh for this programming i First, want to thank, of course, the leadership of the church pastor and Reverend Dr. Grandpa Amos Parkinson. Um, I also want to thank Reverend Jackson, Everton Jackson. I also want to thank uh, Reverend the Honorable Uncle Norman Hemming. Um, and then, of course, the Historical and Cultural Committee. Um, glasses are foggy right now. Sister C. Morris, <laughs> you moved from one side to the next. Okay, Sister Bernice Seymour, I would like to thank, of course, um, special, special, special thank you to Sister Corrine King, who was actually, um, if we talk about the history of black history for First Baptist of Sunrise, um, Sister King was uh, the spearhead for this. And um, I can't speak for her, but I can imagine from the inception and of this idea to see how it is now. She um, has been my personal mentor throughout my life. Um, and so to sit opposite her um, is very special. I'd like to thank, <laughs> yeah. I'd like to thank Sister Roy, Sister Jacqueline Roy, I'd also like to thank um, our former chair, Brother Leroy Kerr, um, and all his support and all his wisdom um, in planning this year. Uh, I would also like to thank, am I missing, um, Sister Barkley, um, and she has been fighting um, illness throughout um, the month of January, and so she has been very dedicated, even in her illness, to um, making sure that this program is um, running smoothly. Did I forget anybody else? Sister Jonas, yes, Sister Jonas Clark, um, Sister um, Coral Jonas, thank you so much as well. Um, I know I saw her. Okay, there we go. I know I saw you. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. And just to let you know, membership is always open. So <laughs> membership is always open. You can always use the help. Um, so the song that we will be singing to open up every night, it is the Black National Anthem. Lift every voice and sing. And that is what I hope to hear every night is for us to lift up our voices and sing through the trial, through the tribulation, through the triumph, lift up our voice. So please, if we could stand, the lyrics will be projected on the screen. Uh, thank you for coming to save me, Deacon. <laughs> It's not my ministry. <laughs> Just before we sing.
Can we put our hands together for the youthful leader, Sister Neshma Jones? Yes. <laughs> we appreciate you, my sister. God bless. Lift every voice and sing. Are we ready? Lift every voice and sing Till earth and heaven ring Ring with the harmonies Of liberty Let our rejoicing rise High as the listening skies let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising sun of our new day begun let us march on till victory is won now God of weary years, God of our silent tears, though who has brought us thus far along the way, thou who has by thy might led us into the light. Keep us forever in the path we pray. Sing a song full of the hope that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Still, one more verse? No? Okay. Stony. Verse number two. Don't want us to sing that one? Okay. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in the days when hope mankind was born, yet with a steady beat. Have not our weary feet come to the place where um, the side we have come over a way that with tears has been watered. We have come. Treading or path through the blood of the slaughtered Out from the gloomy past Till now we stand at last Where the white gleam of our bright star is cast why should we leave that verse out? Bless the Lord. Yes. Thank you, Sister Neshma, no, for having thank me. You. Yes. <laughs> thank yes. you. And I know I just said I don't know anybody who can pray like Sister Bahari, and I don't know anybody who can sing like Deacon Lenny. 
Man, and you did such a great job earlier today. Thank you. Um, our homework, we have four nights to sing this song. We need to study the words. All right, hopefully, hopefully by the end of this, we don't even have to look at the projector. The wonderful thing about this song, right? Um, and if you want to look, it's in your hymn, hymnals, page 627. But the wonderful thing about this song, other than it's, uh, there's a reason why it was chosen to be the national anthem. But there is a particular part of the chorus where it says, um, he has taken us from our dark past, right? That's point one. And then it talks about him seeing us through our present, our day to day. And then it says, as we look to the rising sun, which we know is the future, right? And this is what our focus will be for this month. And it should be not just for the month. Every month, every year is that he has been with us in our silent tears in the past. He is with us daily. And we will be looking to, with him and moving forward with him in the future. And as we look at um, Black History Month this year for 2022, we will be looking at not only the past, but the present, but we also want to be solution focused as we look towards the future. So we know that sometimes our history can be very um, emotionally taxing. It is very hard, no matter how many times we hear it, right? Um, and it's important to repeat it and, and to know, have the generations continue to hear it, but it can be very emotionally taxing. And so we don't ever want to stay stuck in the past. And um, of course, all we have is the now, right, our present, but we always want to be moving in a way that is conscientious of our future and is solution oriented. And so that is how our programming looks, all right? So I just wanted to point that out. Um, we're moving on with our program. Sister Bernice Seymour will be reading our uh, scripture. You can find Bibles in the um, underneath your chairs behind you. Um, it'll also be highlighted in the back. Just, yes. And so here for our reading, please stand. Good evening. Our reading for tonight comes from Galatians chapter 5. I'll be reading from verse 1 through to verse 6. Galatians 5, 1 through 2, verse 6. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ had made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. The reading of the word. Um, so we'll be moving into the offering collection portion of service. Um, please give according to what has been placed on your heart. Um, and I would ask the ushers, whoever, um, to come forward. Uh, Pastor, Reverend and Dr. Amos Ferguson, could I have you bless? Come up afterwards.
Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Everything and everything is appreciated as we continue to um, just move forward with ministry and what we've been charged to do um, as children of the Most High. So thank you for all of your um, offerings. Um, we are moving into the portion of the night, the educational portion. Um, very excited to introduce our, it says guest speaker, but I won't say that. Um, we know him. He has um, blessed this pulpit and blessed us on Youth Sundays with his invigorating um, and thoughtful um, lectures and um, made us, challenged us um, to move forward and increase our walk. And so I am so honored to be able to introduce um, the Reverend, the Honorable Norman Hemming as he comes and speaks to us about a global perspective of black health and wellness. So if you could all please welcome him as he comes up. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Are you excited to be here this evening? It's the first um, Sunday in Black History Month. So we're going to start off with a little bit of singing, a song that I think will be familiar with you. You've, you've heard, you've, we've sung the, the Black National Anthem, but there is this other song that I wanted for us to sing as we get into this evening. And as, we, as we're laying it up today, the intention is to do exactly as Nation has said, right? Is to look at the past, to look at the present, and then to look at um, solutions for the future. That'll come from all of you here, okay? Amen? Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns 
endures. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. My chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine yes he'll be forever mine yes he'll be forever mine wow what a wonderful song and it is so good to be with you here today I know my wife thought that, um, she said that the committee is mocking me, that's why they were asking me to speak on a global perspective of health and wellness, the fattest guy in the church. But, <laughs> but I told her, no, no, these are Christian prayerful people, they would not be mocking me by asking me to do this. All right, that there is, there is something here. And this whole notion of the chains being broken um, is something for us to, to, to look at. If I could, since we're in church, I'll just read a quick passage of scripture. I know we, we had a passage earlier that was perfect, actually. But if, I'm going to look at 2 Kings, the 18th chapter, and read verses 1 through 4 from the NIV. It says, in the third year of Hazael, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah. Some of your versions say Abi, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehushtan. All right, uh, a global perspective on health and wellness. The first slide that we have up here in terms of dealing with what uh, Neshma told us about earlier, going from the past, the, uh, the present, and looking forward to the future. Is there anything on that slide that looks familiar to anyone here? Anyone in the medical professional, the nursing field, or, or, been, or seen an ambulance, or been picked up by an ambulance, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's, it's interesting. So that, um, the pastor scripture that we just read from 2 Kings, the 18th chapter, in, fa in fact, in verse 4, speaking about Nehushtan, the, the pole with the bronze snake wrapped around it, is now what we use every day. It didn't, so it's right in your Bible, right? You're, imagine your neighborhood uh, pharmacy and uh, uh, ambulance drivers took it right out of your Bible and, and slapped it on the side of their, their wagons that they take people to the hospital in. Well, it's not something that's strange or new because it goes back to the Bible, but goes back to even a time that um, is way before um, what is discussed in 2 Kings, the 18th chapter and the fourth verse. In, in fact, the person that you see appearing on the farthest less left portion of the first slide that's up there is a gentleman by the name of um, Imhotep. And, and Imhotep is interesting 
Um, he's interesting because many of the folks that are here, Sister King and others will tell you, the, the teachers and the historians as well as the medical community, will, will tell you that the, the Hippocratic Oath, which every doctor takes um, all around the world, um, and that Hippocrates really um, was a Roman citizen, and that in fact the Hippocratic Oath is really referring to Asclepius, and Asclepius is the Greek name for that gentleman that you see in the leftmost portion of your screen, screen Imhotep, who is actually an African. And um, Imhotep would have um, lived some 2,655 2, years uh, before the coming of Christ um, here on earth. What's interesting about him and why it's important for us to, um, to, to start off the evening speaking about him and the medical insignia that we see on the far right and what's contained in the middle. What's contained in the middle is actually Neshutan, as is being described in 2 Kings, the 18th chapter, and the, four, the fourth verse. You see, after Moses, after God had instructed Moses, you remember what happened, why they made that thing? Because <laughs> God had instructed Moses uh, to, to, make, to make this pole wrap a broad snake around it, have them look up to the snake, and then they would be healed, because God had sent these killer snakes among them, right? <laughs> like snakes on a plane, right? <laughs> God had said these snakes because they had been complaining about the manna um, from heaven. Well, it's interesting um, that um, <clears throat> the, the, in, in our passage of scripture, the, the children of Judah, because this is the southern kingdom, the northern kingdom has, has already been ripped away and sent into exile. But this uh, southern kingdom um, is at a loss, right? Because they're continuing not to worship God but to pay homage to this snake on a pole, <laughs> right? So, it, so it's funny. So Isaiah comes in later in, in this chapter, and he has to tell them, no, 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 what are, what are you guys doing? This is wrong. And so Hezekiah, in fact, tears down that pole and destroys it. He says, why are you burning incense to a pole? I know Moses did this, and God told him to do it, but that didn't tell you you should be worshiping this pole and this snake, right? <clears throat> Enough said. However, um, in terms of the history of medicine, um, this uh, Hippocrates, or Asclepius as the Greek would have, Greeks would have called him, they all tell you that they are, are all children or sons of Imhotep. And you know how when you were learning about your African history, you always thought that us as people from um, Africa, you know, we, um, we're so glad that we were brought over in slave ships um, here to the New World, but because otherwise we'd be running our own little dirt huts, right? you know, um, on, with dirt floors, um, yelling and screaming at each other, right? And, and, and also that we didn't have any written language. In fact, it's one of the things that we're told, right? And it's true that we had grails who recorded our oral history, but did you know that 2,655 years before Christ came, that this little gentleman here, this African named Imhotep, had written down over three thousand medical uses for plants, wrote them down. And he said, well, oh, that's good. Yes, my grandmother does the same thing. You know, if, right? If I have a cold, she tell me to cut single Bible and, right? <laughs> right? So he said, well, I'm not impressed by that, right? But it's all contained in what's called the Edwin Smith Papyrus. It's named after Mr. Smith, not because he wrote it. It's named after him because he is the person who discovered it, kind of like how Christopher Columbus discovered the new world. All right, and so, but it was written by Imhotep, all right? But not only does it have 3,000 uses for plants 2,655 years ago, it also contains the treatment for over 200 diseases. Someone is saying amen because we're in the midst of a pandemic, right? <laughs> so, but in addition to that, it also um, carefully details how to treat appendicitis. 2,600 years before Christ has come. Not only does it do, do that, anybody here, you don't have to raise your hand, anybody here knows of anyone who suffers from gout. It details the treatment, the effective treatment of gout, and how to remove wisdom teeth. <laughs> you know, and you say, well, I'm not so impressed, uh, Brother Hebe. That doesn't impress me, this African being able to do all of those things so far ago. But in addition to all of that, he also wrote down detailed instructions for 48 different surgical procedures that he was performing, including the removal of cataracts on the eyes of his patients 2,600 years before Christ has come, Hundred, way before Hippocrates, way before um, Asclepius. 
Um, and he was serving a king who had this thing, Nehushtan, on the Pharaoh who had the Nehushtan on his crown. Okay, so that's why we're reading from that passage um, of scripture. But one of the funniest things about him is that he is the person who actually gives us what we know today as, the, as aspirin, this guy, um, Imhotep, right? Because he wrote down also in the papyrus the use of the willow plant to, as, um, as an anti-inflammatory and as used to, to prevent pain. Can you believe this? Do you know when ba the Bayer Aspirin Company in Germany patented their aspirin patent? Some, the two, two competing dates. One says it was December of 1899. Another says it was this month, February of the year 1900. <clears throat> that is almost 4,000 years later, more than 4,000 years later, than when, this, than when your people, right, your doctor here, who every doctor in the world pays homage to in the Hippocratic Oath, was giving out aspirin through the willow plant. All right, the next slide, please. It's, it's very important that we understand that in terms of a historical um, context and also because um, global health and well-being has a lot to do with how we view ourselves and, and the things that we're able to accomplish. And right now we have the Olympics, the Winter Olympics going on um, over in, in um, China, right? And everyone is all excited about that. We're hoping that we're going to see the Jamaican bobsled team, but I don't even know if we're, if we're there again this year. I'm sorry, we are? Oh, thank you. So thank you so very much. All right, then. I'm just kidding, all right? All right. But uh, one of the things um, in terms of understanding global health and well-being is this Latin phrase that actually traces its roots back to Africa. It's a Latin phrase that some of you may have seen on your schools here in the United States or your schools back in Jamaica. Mensana in corpore sano. <clears throat> it, it, it means a sound mind and a sound body, or a healthy mind and a healthy body. And in fact, the person who wrote this, um, this little ditty here, he said, you should pray for a healthy mind in a healthy body. Ask for a stout heart that has no fear of death. Sounds like what Christians should be doing. All right. Let's go to the next slide, which is just a very bland slide there that talks about our global perspective and health and wellness. Um, in, a most, in a recent study in the year 2020, um, doctors in the United States found out or discovered that blacks and Hispanics receive worse care in 40 quality measurable areas in medicine. I know, please don't, don't, be, don't panic, though. Remember, there good, there's good news at the end. <laughs> don't panic, right? Um, black patients were less likely than white patients, they found, to receive analgesics. <clears throat> you remember what I was just talking about earlier, how 2,600 years ago, we had already invented aspirin, and we're giving it out, and we're doing all these surgeries? Well, in 2020, two years ago, we have a hard time as blacks getting any kind of painkillers in the hospital. In fact, in a review of emergency rooms across the United States, what they found was that 57% to 74% of the time, black patients were significantly less likely to receive pain medication than white patients. In, in fact, the AMA did a study of one million children um, who have gone through the hospital system in the United States with, remember I told you before that this guy Imhotep wrote out detailed instructions for how to treat appendicitis? Well, they did a, a study of a million children with appendicitis in the United States. What did you think that they found out? They found out that these little black children who went into the hospital with appendicitis were far less likely, well, not only did they die at higher rates, they were far less likely to receive any pain medication. For the, I don't know if you've ever experienced or gone through appendicitis and the excruciating pain uh, that accompanies it. 
But part of it comes from a vestige of slavery, right? It has nothing to do with our history, right? We clearly understood how to treat these things and we understood who we were. But unfortunately, um, this idea of, of race, which is a pretty recent social construct, um, doctors actually started believing that black people had thicker skin, thicker skulls, less sensitive nervous systems. I in fact, it was customary in medical schools for doctors to be taught that black people don't feel pain, especially if they're being punished. I in fact, it was such a widespread belief. Remember, this, um, anything that I say here today doesn't make you better than anybody else should not engender any hate or hatred in your heart towards anyone else, right? This is just the story of human beings who have fallen, right? And who um, need to come to know Christ, just like we need to come to know Christ or we have come to know Christ, okay? So it's your opportunity to go out and to evangelize. <clears throat> it was so widespread that the United States military itself conducted mustard gas tests on their black soldiers unbeknownst to them. They, they did it because they didn't think that they could feel the kind of pain their white soldiers could feel. Not only did they use mustard gas on their black soldiers, they used other chemicals to see what the effects would be and how long it would take for them to expire. This is coming at the end of World War II. Our next slide, please. The reason that I asked uh, my sister to sing that song, even though it's the new version of the song, Amazing Grace, is because the person who penned that song, he was a part of this whole notion of blacks having thicker skulls, thicker skin, unable to feel pain, having less sensitive nervous systems. In fact, this is what John Newton said. He says, slaves are lesser creatures without Christian souls and thus not destined for the next world. Amazing grace. Because we're looking at a global perspective, it might be helpful to look at the Caribbean for part of what we're dealing with, as well as look at here in the United States, because this is where all of us live, right? But many of us have come from the Caribbean. Well, there was this doctor. His name was Dr. John Queer. <clears throat> and during slavery in Jamaica, um, he took over 300, I'm sorry, 850 slaves. We can actually go to the next slide. Thank you. He took over 850 slaves, and he did tests on them on different types of cures for smallpox on the slaves. Of course, they're slaves, so they couldn't give consent. It's not like today where if someone calls you and says, listen, we're trying out this new drug for... Um, Omicron, <laughs> and would you like to participate in this? You can sign this waiver. There was no such thing with these black slaves, right? And it, there was no such thing because the medical community, <clears throat> whatever you believe, they, they, uh, they say they honestly believed that these blacks wouldn't feel what they were doing to them. So in Jamaica, he took 850 of those slaves, and his remedies for smallpox at the time, including bloodletting, literally slicing their veins and allowing the blood to flow out to see whether or not that would help to cure smallpox. Uh, he also gave them, you know how when you were a little child, your mom might have given you, what is that, herb? To flush you out at the end of summer, or whatever it is that people do in the States as well, right? <laughs> but he would, he would give them such high dosages of things to cause dysentery in them. He says, this will cure your smallpox. Others, he would place blisters behind their ears and their necks. <clears throat> it's interesting. There were actually more physicians on the island of Jamaica in, in the year 1800 than there were on the island of Jamaica in the year 1900. So you would say to yourself, oh, see, Brother Hemming, that means that these slave masters were caring. <laughs> They were caring for these slaves. No, 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 they weren't caring for the slaves. They were performing experiments on these slaves. In fact, 
in the United States at the same time that we saw Dr. Queer doing these weird things in Jamaica and elsewhere. In fact, also um, in Grenada, there were some also strange experiments going on on blacks. Um, you would find white physicians in the United States at the same time, they would routinely advertise on plantations, will pay cash. We can look at the next slide, actually. Oh, the, the, the picture that you see on the, the pictures on the right, that was another test that was going on um, on the island of Jamaica by some other doctors. You ever heard of this disease called yaws? Yes. <laughs> right. So, 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 so what happened, <clears throat> the, the, these African slaves, how many people know that <clears throat> it's not just Imhotep that understood medicine, that some of these slaves who were brought over, they were doctors themselves back home. <laughs> So, so they would say to these European physicians, no, 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 allow us to treat the people who have yours. And then you treat a, a, a group that has yours as well, and let's see which one of them becomes healthy. And so that's what you see depicted in the pictures on the right-hand side of, the, of that slide. Almost all the patients treated by the African slave doctor got well, and the the doctors who were European using what they thought was, would have been cures, these patients died. So, and the next slide, thank you, good. So, um, a large number of these physicians in the US would say, we'll pay cash for Negroes suffering from chronic diseases, <laughs> you know? And, and they would pay cash for Negroes suffering from um, chronic diseases because they could do experiments on them that they could not do on the rest of the population. But remember what Newton said, that they don't have souls, these blacks, so they're not going to heaven anyway. So you, you're free. So what they would do is they would take young black children who had different illnesses of the brain, and they would drill holes without any anesthetics. Now no, remember, Imhotep 2,600 years before Christ had already been using anesthetics. <laughs> but they would drill holes in the, in the heads of these little children to try to treat um, catastrophic illnesses that these um, children had. <clears throat> but it, it wasn't, what's strange is that Although you had them doing all of these tests and all of these studies, some of which actually worked out quite well, right? Because in obstetrics and gynecology, much of what we know today in the medical community in OBGYN was learned as a result of, of trials and experiments that were conducted on black slave women without their consent, without any anesthesia. <laughs> Things that we did to them is how you today now benefit, right? from having some great OBGYN care. So some people might say, oh, isn't that wonderful? Anyone saying that? Praise be to God. <laughs> All right, then. <clears throat> but today in the United States, the United States has the highest mortality rates among comparable developed countries. But in the United States, it's not that we have the highest mortality rate of women who are pregnant. The problem is for these black and Hispanic women, although we have the highest rate of mortality for pregnant women here in the United States in terms of developed countries, black women in the United States are four times more likely to die in childbirth than their white counterparts today. Not only are, are, are these um, African-American women dying at these astronomical rates in childbirth, something that Imhotep would have described for them how to <laughs> properly do OBGYN, <laughs> um, they, the, these women also found themselves, when they went into the hospital, that they didn't receive the treatment that they thought that they were supposed to be receiving. In fact, one of those women was Henrietta Lacks who was taken to one of the best hospitals in the United States, in Baltimore. In fact, if, 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 um, if some of us today fell ill, 
we would demand to be taken to that hospital because John Hopkins is one of the world's premier research hospitals. But for this woman, Henrietta Lacks, who had cervical cancer, it, it's not that she received great treatment for cervical cancer. It's that the doctors and the researchers discovered when they started removing some of those cancer cells from her that she had unique cancer cells. She had new, unique cancer cells because her cancer cells they could, in a petri dish, allow them to divide and to grow and therefore do even longer research. In fact, it, it seemed as if her cancer cells were immortal. So they took her cancer cells and they used them in untold number of studies all around the United States and Europe on cancer. Sounds like a good thing to do, right? After they did these, the research using her cancer cells, they call them the HeLa cells. What, what was her name? Henrietta Lacks, <laughs> right? They, they patented all the drugs that they developed for her cancer cells, and her children, her grandchildren, received how much money for that? Even though it was against her will, that she had no idea they were doing this, they received nothing. That's why you see this lawsuit taking place that you heard announced last year, and is progressing, um, progressing this year. We can go to the to the next slide. And the next slide are just some other depictions of this, um, of Imhotep. Um, and we can skip through until the slide with the gentleman who has the, yes, here it is, so great. What is that thing that's on his arm again? I'm, I keep forgetting the name of this medical equipment. What does it use? A blood pressure cuff, thank you so very much. I knew there would be somebody here who would know, <laughs> right? So one of the interesting things about this um, blood pressure cuff and the testing for hypertension um, is that it's a good thing, right? That we know that you should have a blood pressure of how much? 120 over 80? But there's a new one, right? There's a new, isn't there a new finding? But anything under how much? Thank you so very much. Anything under 140? I hear someone say 120 over here. <clears throat> and it sounds good that these things are happening. Um, one of the things that we find out about health, hypertension, diabetes, is that these two diseases are linked um, inseparably to education. So one of the vestiges of slavery, not of our history, we have a history of being medicine people, right? People who, are, uh, who understand <laughs> medicine. One of, the, one of the legacies um, of slavery, if we can skip to the next slide, we're going to come back to hypertension, is that on the island of Jamaica, and in fact, in every Caribbean island, whether it's French speaking, whether it's they speak Spanish, or they speak the Queen's English, and this is the Queen's 70th year ruling on the throne. In 19, what year did Jamaica gain their independence? And what year was uh, Trinidad's independence? Same year, same year, 1962. <laughs> exactly. Well, after three to 400 years of slavery in the Caribbean, in Brazil, uh, Central, South America, how many people do you, th what do you think the, the literacy rate was on the island of Jamaica at independence in 1962? The literacy rate. Yeah, yeah, it's the reverse. It was 20%. <laughs> so, oh, and, and, and oh, Sister King is saying, yes, I've met many Jamaicans. It's true, they don't have any literacy. No, I'm just kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, kidding. Calm down, calm down. <laughs> but in 1962, 80% of the people on the island of Jamaica were effectively illiterate after 400 years of slavery. Because slaves weren't entitled to an education. And the thing that you did with slaves is that you wanted to work them as hard as you could. You wanted to get slaves who would survive the Middle Passage. So you wanted to get slaves who um, had the ability to make it through this treacherous passage while laying in their own urine and feces, while being fed slop, to get them to the new world. During this middle passage, if slaves, um, 
refused to eat the slop that you were serving them, they would take a set a, a device, much like pliers, and they would remove two to three of their teeth from the front of their mouth. And then they would force a rod down their throat and they would pour the food in to feed them. I apologize for the young children. <clears throat> and the kind of food that they were being fed, which is why Pastor Farkas would have been a much better person to speak on global health and well-being. The kind of food that they were being fed was food. No, seriously, because Pastor Farkas doesn't eat that stuff. <laughs> right? The kind of food that they were, be, unlike me, who just loved the pig, right? The kind of food that they were being fed um, was food that was highly salted. It was food that had high concentration, concentration of sugar. It was food that was meant to survive for a long period of time, and it was a different diet than they would have been eating back on the continent of Africa in those 54 countries that we have today. As a result of that, if we go to the next slide, Sixty percent of people in the Caribbean today who are over the age of 60 are suffering from a combination of diabetes and hypertension. Sixty percent. Based on these two diseases alone, Caribbean blacks are the unhealthiest people on the face of the earth. After years of eating salt fish, salt pork, salt mackerel, witnessing their children being sold away from them in slavery, witnessing their wives being raped, witnessing themselves and others being beaten. In fact, most young girls brought as slaves to the Caribbean, and in particular to the island of Jamaica, never made it to age 12, because they had been raped so often that they didn't survive. But don't worry, here in America, we have other things. You remember, one of, what's one of the tastiest things you like eating in the United States? Um, mackerel fried chicken, that's really good. But macaroni and cheese, right? Did you know that macaroni and cheese was actually something that was developed by a, an, an African-American slave who herself was being raped since she was age nine years old? But it wasn't developed by her. It was actually developed by her brother, who was a few years older. You might, you might know her, because she has the same last name as me. Her name is Sally Hemings. But her brother is the one who invented this dish called macaroni and cheese. So not only did we have these things happening in the Caribbean, these strange way of treating fellow humans, but we had the same things happening here. And as a result, these 60% of people over the age of 60 in the Caribbean today, in 2022, are unable to metabolize sugar and salt appropriately. Today, as, a, as descendants of slaves, and as a result, it is believed that in the next 20 years, this is going to create economic disaster in the Caribbean, this being the health care of these people who are dying prematurely as a result of a vestige of slavery and a diet of slavery that they continue to eat. In fact, it is said that the people of the Caribbean are genetically modified blacks because they were genetically modified to survive. What's scarier is this. Remember we talk about all these testings that were, that were being done on blacks? Well, one of the things that blacks didn't get tested for is for hypertensive medication. In fact, there are few, if any, studies on blacks for hypertensive medication. Africans living still on the continent of Africa and whites living in the United States and in Europe find themselves with 80 to 90% of their hypertension being effectively treated by the current um, pharmaceutical drugs for hypertension that we have today. That's not true for 
this subset of blacks in the Caribbean. So think about that for a minute. Those Africans who were left, who were taken by slave ships here, whites in the United States and whites in Europe, are effectively treated by their, treated by their hypertensive medication. But because there are no studies done on blacks in the Caribbean, we find ourselves in a very precarious situation. So once again, you're saying to yourself, thank God I'm here in the United States. <laughs> we're good, yeah. We're good. <laughs> and we have the, oh, you mean so softly that Imhotep would have written about in this, one of his 3,000 ways of treating diseases from plants? Literally, right? Um, so is there hope um, for the Caribbean? We can go to the next slide. Diabetes in the United States, we're talking about now. Um, Asian American men, 9% of them um, have, uh, suffer from diabetes. 7.3% of, Amer of Asian American women suffer from diabetes. But for blacks, 12.2% of black men are afflicted with diabetes. But 13.2% of black women are afflicted with diabetes. And Hispanics don't fare very much better. 12.6% of Hispanic men are afflicted with diabetes. All of this is a vestige of slavery, and 11.7% of Hispanic women. Um, white women are afflicted, 6% of them suffer from diabetes, and 8.1% of white men presently in the United States. Let's go to the next slide. How do we change some of these things. How can we look to the past to get encouragement for what it is that we were able to accomplish, the greatness of our forefathers, how smart and intelligent we were and are today? How can we then look at our present and, and see what's happening in our world today and then try to change what we're doing so that we can be just as smart as those in the past and provide hope for those who are to come, these little children and their offspring to come in the future. In fact, if you have friends who are Nigerian and who belong to the Igbo tribe, they routinely name their children Chichin Yenwa. Chichin Yenwa. Because they actually read the Bible. It means children are a gift of God. And so if we believe that our children are a gift of God, then we have to start looking at how it is that we're going to change our present. We can't do anything about the past, right? but we can change our present. So let's look at some of the things that we eat today that we call soul food. I told you about macaroni and cheese that you can see on that plate, which is an African, well, an African-American made <laughs> delicacy. <laughs> Right, But we see fried chicken, we see okras. Okras actually were a staple part of the diet back in many nations in sub-Saharan Africa. But not the way we make it. You see it there on that plate? Fried and <laughs> floured and fried. Not the way that they would have been eating it. <laughs> and then the cornbread chock full of high fructose corn syrup and sugar. And then even, <clears throat> even the greens. Even you would say, well, at least we have the greens that we eat as soul food. Even the greens, we fill it with so much fat, so much salt, that it contributes to the hypertension problems that globally blacks and Hispanics are suffering from outside of Africa. We can continue eating the way that we're eating now, and no one loves fried chicken more than me. In fact, my son calls me fried chicken. <laughs> and every, every day I want to have, of course, um, well, at least every Thursday, I think Dutch Pot makes um, stew peas with the pig's tail, the salted pig's tail, and the, and, the, and the salted beef, right? And it tastes so good, so scrumptious, right? And you know I suffer from hypertension, right? <laughs> but I can't help myself. <laughs> right? But what I realized in preparing for this lesson on global health and well-being 
that if we don't make a change, we're not leaving any hope for the children who are to come because they're learning to eat just like we learn to eat. Not from something that was good. If you could flip to the, flip three slides, next one and the next one. The slides that we flipped past were, were some organic foods and then a depiction in a hieroglyph from Egypt of what people would have been eating in Egypt, in Sudan, in Ethiopia, and in much of North Africa to the west at the time. They were eating, and if we go back, I'm sorry, can we, can we go back? If we can't go back, it's fine. Yeah, to the, the hieroglyph, yes. And you would have noticed there that they would have been having eggs, right? They would have been having some type of fowl, right? Not necessarily the tasty church's fried chicken that I love so much, <laughs> but some type of fowl. And, but they would have had a lot of beans and greens and fish. And not, not I don't mean battering the fish and frying it. <laughs> they would have had a lot, of, a lot of fish. But if we skip ahead to what we, what we were being fed on the middle passage, this picture. And you'll say, Brother Heming, why are you being so outrageous? You see, the things that you were being fed on the middle passage, let me, let me tell you some of the, the, um, the recipes on the middle passage. So they would put beans together. Good. They would mix the beans in with their coffee grounds. They would add sugar and salt to the coffee grounds and the beans. And if you refused to eat it, they would force feed it through your throat. And they would throw in a little bit of fat, a good measure. On the plantations, whether in the Caribbean or here in the United States, Central or South America, it wasn't very much different. In fact, the things that blacks ate as slaves on the plantation was the garbage of the plantation. People who lived in the big house, they ate, that's where the phrase comes, to live high on the hog, or any other animal. But the things that we were fed, our forefathers would have been fed, which are the things that have become the staple of our diets today. Not knocking it, right, because it's quite tasty, except Pastor Farkasson knew all his life not to eat it. it. Was garbage. It was just the garbage. So it was the tongue of the cow. It was the ears. It was the intestines. It was the feet of the pig that contains, the only animal, right, that contains this this line running through its feet that's constantly excreting pus because of the amount of toxins in its body. But that's the part that we would eat as ham hock, right? The, 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 the belly, the intestines of the animals is what we would eat. And if you are a good Jamaican, what is tastier for you than to see the teeth of your neighborhood goat floating in the, in the mannish water along with his testicles and, right? What could be tastier? Do you understand why I'm saying that what we were being fed was the garbage of the plantation? Because in fact it was. It was everything that was fatty, everything that was considered entrails, everything that no white person would have eaten was what we were being fed. Until today, we start to think of it as our native foods, right? You try to take away salt mackerel or salt fish from anybody from the Caribbean. They take out the machete and chop you up. Right? You try to tell, not Sister King, but friends of hers, that they should stop eating chitlings and hog more. Right? And they're, 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 they'll take their gun out quickly and start shooting at you. They'll say, what a wicked person you are to tell me that I shouldn't eat that. But it's not just what we ingest in our bodies. It also has to do with our mental health. If we could flip to the next slide. Every 11 minutes in the United States, a person commits suicide. Every 11 minutes. The rates are higher among African Americans and Hispanics. And especially during these two years of the pandemic, we've seen untold increases in suicides among our children. In fact, for people between the ages 
of 10 and 35 in across all racial groups. The second highest cause of death is suicide. Think about that. For your neighbor's child, your child, your grandchild. And you, you know how um, you Caribbean people always mock uh, Caribbeans who went to England, right? What do you always say about them? They said they were a little touched, <laughs> right? And you laugh about it, right? You think it's kind of funny that these British people are a little touched, these Caribbeans who went to Britain. Well, there is this ship that we see here. It's called the Windrush. It was one of many ships that took Caribbean people, many Jamaicans, though, mostly Jamaicans, from the Caribbean from the year 1948 to the year 1971. When these, these Windrush ships were being sent to England, because it was after the war, and what they found out was that they had lost so many men in the war. Many of the women who had entered the labor force in Britain had gone back home or gone back to school. And so the industrial machinery in Britain had grown to a halt, and they needed labor to come in and do the work. They tried at first bringing whites from Eastern Europe to fill the gap, but they didn't work out so well. But then they found these Jamaicans and Grenadians and Trinidadians and Guyanese and how hard they worked. So they brought them over during those years. What happened when they brought them over, though, is that they came with their little children. And their little children needed to go to school. But what, but what do you think happened when um, good upper crust white folk, who are aristocratic, found these little children of African descent coming over on these boats to land. They were wondering, should these children go to school with our children? Just like here in the United States. Nothing different, right? Except they were much more sophisticated in how they did it. What they did with the little children coming from the Caribbean at the time was that they told the parents, many of whom, some were skilled, some were nurses, some were going to learn to become nurses and teachers in, in Britain. Others were uneducated. What they told them was, we're going to be putting your children in specialized schools where they're going to have more one-on-one -on -one training. In England, that's what they're doing, all throughout England. <laughs> and so we're not going to send them to your neighborhood school. But you don't worry, they're going to better schools, specialized training. And so they sent these children to schools with with ch other children who were um, handicapped, who were mentally deficient. And that's where these little children from the Caribbean went to school. So when you laugh and say these people from Britain are touched in the head, they were literally being placed in institutions with mental patients for their schooling. In fact, it was not until this man by the name of Bernard Cord from Grenada he went on a scholarship to Britain to do his master's and his doctoral work. And a white teacher in the school system in Great Britain came to him and said, do you know what they're doing with these children from the Caribbean in these schools? They label them as not being smart enough, not being educable. And, and, and the reason that they say they're not educable is because they speak with all these weird accents, you know? Uno go down there so. They can't even speak English properly. At the same time, there were Pakistani and Indian children coming over. But they said, no, 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 we, these are discernible languages that these children are speaking. They are educable. It's these blacks <laughs> that we have to send to these specialized schools. And so for many of our smart, intelligent, children who could have become like Imhotep and would have been doctors and engineers and lawyers and, and, and pastors and nurses and teachers and, and every profession that you could think of. They were instead railroaded in giving a substandard education in Great Britain until Bernard Cord and a group of people decided to put an end. They started publicizing it. And in terms of what Nishmar asked us, what did they do? to stop this corruption of the education process. They said, if you won't educate us, we'll educate ourselves. So all across Great Britain, these Caribbean people 
open up their own schools to educate their children. Guess what happened here in the United States? Sister King will tell you. We did the same thing here. We opened up schools for ourselves to train our children when we thought they weren't being educated appropriately. If we could go to the last slide, because it's late and we have to get home after catch churches before it closes. No, 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 I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Calm down, calm down. Not, well, not so much. All right, all right. But where, where do we go? Where do we go from here for Black History Month? Global health and well-being. Well, I think one of the things that we have to look at is that we have to look at 2 Kings, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 4. And when you get home, take, your, take an opportunity to read through that entire chapter and also the 19th chapter of 2 Kings. One of the first things that Hezekiah realized and that his mother, Abby, realized is that when you're growing up in a society where everyone is crazy around you and no one has your best interests at heart, you have to teach your children yourself, right? You have to educate them and make sure that they're literate, that they get the best education possible. It's why all these African-American mothers and these Caribbean mothers and fathers took their children to what they call extra lessons after various levels of school, not because they wanted to show off, but because they wanted to give them the best future that they could possibly have, a future that they themselves were not afforded, is why they did it. And that's what we find Abby doing in Second Kings, the 18th chapter. But the next thing that we have to do is not to become puffed up and angry and ready to, to hurt the nearest white person that we see beside us because of what they had done to us, but it's to have what Hezekiah had in Second Kings 4. King Hezekiah, it says, when he realized that everything was hopeless, he tore his garments. He threw ashes on his head. And he went to the sanctuary to pray and to ask God for direction. He showed humility in the midst of all this, all this terrible news that he was seeing. And then he began to pray and to fast and to seek counsel from godly people about what it is that they should do. That's why he sent for Isaiah to tell him what is it that we should do in this hopeless situation. And then lastly, he took action. It's one thing for you to say, I know the history. I understand how brutal and cruel it was. I know the present, what's happening to us right now. God, you help me to be a better person than my mother and my father was, not because they were bad, but because of how they were trained and treated. And then after saying those prayers, you leave like me and you drive down to Church's Fried Chicken to get the, on Wednesdays I think is eight pieces for seven ninety nine. <laughs> right? And, and you, you, go, you go to Dutch Pot on a Thursday to get your stew peas with the pig steel and the corned beef. And you say, listen, I'm a good Jamaican. I, I must have my ackee with salt fish. And don't, don't soak out too much of the salt. Right? No, seriously, because some of these men and women, they'll turn over the table. They soak out too much of the salt in the salt fish. Even though they have the worst hypertension, you know. They're on, they're on three different hypertensive medications. But you soak out too much of that salt and see what they'll do with you. In this Black History Month, as we seek to look forward to the future, let us be like these Igbos. Let us name our children Chichen Yenwa, that they're a child, recognizing that they're a gift from God. And then let us give them a gift for this Black History Month. Let us start by changing the way in which we eat. Don't eat like Brother Henry. And I'm starting to change as well. Don't eat like me. Don't eat like your mom or your grandfather ate. Start to eat like Pastor Farkasin. Right? Change your, I know it's hard, it's very hard. That's why he's the pastor. 
<laughs> right? <laughs> change, change your lives little by little. It's going to take time. Don't worry. Don't panic. It's going to take time. But start cutting out some of these little things so that our children can have a hope and a future. So that global health and wellness will mean that all people, no matter their race, their ethnicity, or their background, will have access to the same level of health care, will get treated the same way when they enter a hospital, and get the same pain medicines that, that everyone else gets, and will live longer lives. And we won't be looking in the Caribbean to, to, in 20 years to an economic calamity. Let us pray. If you could stand with me, if you can, and let us pray. Don't stand too fast, because remember, high blood pressure. Yeah, stand, stand slowly. All right. Grace to the most heavenly Father, we come before you this day. We thank you for this day, the sixth day of February, the day, dear Father, of the birth of Robert Nesta Marley. Robert, Father, as you've taught us, means this famous one, or the famous glow. But his name is, his middle name, Nesta, means a messenger. Father, allow all of us to be not like Bob Marley, but to be Nestas, to be messengers of the good news, not only of the good news of you dying on the cross for the remission of our sins and to give us hope and a future, but help us to become the messengers who will teach and train those in our households and train ourselves to eat right, to live right, so that we will have sound minds in a sound body and that we can live a, leave a hope and a future to our children, that their future will be so much brighter than ours. Father, thank you for how you've brought us along this mighty long way, despite all the vicissitudes of life. And thank you, God, for what you're going to do with our future, because our future is bright. For we ask these things in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. Go in peace, my brothers. Wasn't that amazing? You all can uh, take a seat. I mean, when you think, you, you know you're always going to get something, but then he just raises the bar and then you, you're up for the rest of the night thinking, right? I learned so much and I'm so glad that you have um, enlightened us, educated us, and um, given us hope. Um, as we move forward, not just in this month, but as we make um, really uh, concerted efforts to change what health and wellness looks for us um, individually and collectively. So thank you again. Thank you so much. Um, I don't know about you, but um, Manish Watts is my favorite too. <laughs> And so when he was talking about it, I was thinking about the song. I don't know if you know it, but it's um, Ram Go Live Love Go To Me, <laughs> Manishwant. <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, this, I don't want to give it up. I don't want to give it up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh man, so um, we are coming up to the end, so um, I would like to, just a, a, a slight change in our service, um, oversight by myself, but we do have a, a spiritual that um, none other than Deacon Clark, if um, you could come and share with us. Um, after that, we will have the black prayer um, uh, read and response, a responsive reading with Deacon Sinclair and Deacon Jonas, a closing spiritual, and then finally closing remarks by Pastor Reverend Dr. Amos Farkison. So thank you very much. Um, either one is fine. Those of us who may not remember, King Solomon was black. Yes. He said, I am black but comely. O ye daughters of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. So I'm proud to be a black man. Yes. 
Judge Emming, how can we thank you? I've learned a lot. But my favorite is curry goat. <laughs> we all may have a favorite. Sister Nishma, you've done very well. We thank you. But yes, a Negro spiritual. I should have looked up where this originated, but I did not. But you all know it very well. And those who sacrificed for you and for me, we give God thanks for them. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming forth to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, Coming for to carry me home. One more time. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. And under the strain, they said, mm. 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 That's what they bore for us. Under the strain and under the pressure, under the whips and under the chain. But they said, I looked over Jordan and what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. A band of angels coming after me. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. And as the strain continued, mm, 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 under the heavy burden, but my brothers and sisters, our Jesus went to Calvary for you and for me. We could not have borne what he did. Just like the slaves on that middle passage. So many lives were lost. But they persisted. And those who made it says, If you get there before I do. Coming for to carry me home. Tell all my friends I'm coming to. Coming for to carry me home. Join me now. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. You know why they ask that the chariot be swung low? For short people like me. Because if the chariot was too high, you couldn't reach it because it's going, you know. But... Thank God for those who went ahead and paved the way for you and me so that we can say, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Amen. Um, it is here for you if you need it. 
My Lord, I need to have a conversation with you, a serious conversation. Why did you make me black, Lord? Lord, why did you make me black? Why did you make someone the world would hold back? Black is the color of dirty clothes, of grimy hands and feet. Black is the color of darkness, of tired, beaten streets. Why did you give me thick lips? A broad nose, kinky hair. Why did you create someone who receives the hated steers? Black is the color of the bruised eye when someone gets hurt. Black is the color of darkness. Black is the color of dirt. Why is my bone structure so thick? My hips and cheeks so high. Why are my eyes brown? and not the color of the sky. Why do people think I'm useless? How come I feel so used? Why do people see my skin and think I should be abused? Lord, I just don't understand. What is it about my skin? Why is it some people want to hate me and not know the person within? Black is what people are labeled when others want to keep them away. Black is the color of shadows cast. Black is the end of the day. Lord, you know my own people mistreat me. And you know this just ain't right. They don't like my hair, they don't like my skin, and they say, I'm too dark or too light. Lord, don't you think it's time to make a change? Why don't you redo creation and make everyone the same? Why did I make you black? Why did I make you black? I made you in the color of coal from which beautiful diamonds are found. I made you in the color of oil, the black gold which keeps people warm. Your color is the same as the rich dark soil that grows the food you need. Your color is the same as the black stallion and panther. Oh, what majestic! Creatures indeed. 
All colors of the heaven and the rainbow can be found throughout every nation. When all these colors are blended, you become my greatest creation. You're here? It is the texture of lamb's wool. And the beautiful creature is he. I am the shepherd who watches them. I'll always watch over thee. You are the color of the midnight sky. I put star glitters in your eyes. There's a beautiful smile hidden beneath your pain. That's why your cheeks are so high. You're the color of dark clouds from the hurricanes I create in September. I made your lips so full and thick. So when you kiss your husband, he will remember. Your stature is strong. Your bone structure thick to withstand the burden of time. The reflection you see in the mirror, that image that looks back, that is mine. So get off your knees, my child. Look in the mirror and tell me what you see. I didn't make you in the image of darkness. I made you in the image of me. My Lord, my Lord, my God, I come to thee and I say, I am sorry. I am sorry for me. Powerful, powerful, powerful. It's all about perspective, right? And that challenges us to stop looking at ourselves in the way that is societally accepted or the normative and to start seeing ourselves the way that God has, uh, God sees us, the way he's created us. Whew, that, thank you, thank you for that. Um, our closing spiritual, if we could have everyone stand to their feet, it is going to be Steal Away Jesus. Um, would love some assistance, some vocal assistance. Steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay here. Steal away, steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay here. My Lord, he calls me, he calls me by the thunder. The trumpet sounds within my soul. I ain't got long to stay. Steal away, steal away, steal away, steal away. 
to Jesus. Steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay. One more time. My Lord, he calls me. He calls me by the thunder. That trumpet sounds within a my soul. I ain't got long to stay. Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus, steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long, I ain't got long, I ain't got long to stay. Thank you very much for coming. It has been a riveting, riveting first night. Um, and I know the lessons taught tonight will not be forgotten. I just want to remind you all that we have a, a, full, sun, a full month of Sundays. Um, so I hope and the expectation is that we tell a friend, I remember, um, when we used to have programs or VBS or whatever, it was always, okay, now you tell your friend, you tell your neighbor, and you bring somebody back, right? And so it grows. And so we hope that this is the snowball that continues to grow into an avalanche until the last Sunday. Um, next Sunday, February 13th, um, we will be talking about the health gap. Um, and our keynote speaker, um, very special to my um, heart, my long friend, who is now Dr. Alicia Roof. Um, very excited to hear her talk about um, the topic that is present on your bulletin. If you do not have one, please pick one up. Remember that there is also an exercise workout day for the church. It is geared towards the very young population here at First Baptist Church of Sunrise. So, all right, it is geared and it is specialized, okay? So go ahead and start laying out your workout clothes. We'll talk about registration as it comes available. But again, thank you so much. I, um, this was an amazing first night and I know it's just the uh, tone that has been set for the rest of the month. Um, so thank you very much, and um, please, uh, for closing remarks, Reverend Dr. Amos Farkison, thank you. Thank you. Our sister Barclay would say, clap yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. A special thanks to the committee. We may not be many, but you started out strong. Thank you. Our chairperson, Neshma. And members of the committee, we are grateful to you. 
Over the years, we have come uh, to cultivate high expectation of our committee and black history. It is special to us here, and there are multi reasons why I would even uh, attempt to name, but you'll understand one who does not know your history subject to. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks to our presenter. He has never failed. Never failed. I do know of that, especially with his high obligations. Uh, this can be very demanding uh, to purposefully challenge us in the way he does. It's not a matter of entertainment, it's education. And I thank you, my brother. Uh, this evening, really, I am somewhat disappointed that more of our people are not here. If you go back to the thrust, the theme of our presentation, you'll understand the reason why it's difficult uh, to break out of the pattern, the rut in which we find ourselves. Because the first requirement is to know, and if you don't know, you will not be in a position to help yourself. And uh, to be candid, the very reason why we seek to promote a Black History Month is for the purpose of our people being educated in the past. You see what uh, the state of Florida is doing? They are endeavoring to erase black history. Mm -hmm. They are not sympathetic with black. We're going to have to learn to help ourselves. I do hope uh, that for the future presentation, we will have more of our people taking the opportunity to be here. As I said this morning, following Christ, responding to, is never convenient. Yet, it is in this inconvenience that we prove our devotion and love for Christ. Hard going. But it is profitable. I thank you for taking the time to be here this evening. And as indicated already, I'm encouraging each and every one of us uh, that uh, we seek to tell others. Someone tell. You may need to pick up someone to get that one here. But it is important for our people to be enlightened in the past. Thank you again. Thanks to each who have contributed uh, to, the e to the evening. And uh, we look forward that next week will be even better. <laughs> Thanks again. You can go home now <laughs> and sleep well. You know, we can be so easily spoiled. If you notice the dynamics, we have become accustomed to not being here on Sunday evening anymore, and so it becomes so difficult to start anew. Remember this, though. Zooming is good, but there is something unique about intimacy coming together.
coming together. Don't allow that art to die out. The Bible knew why it encourages us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It goes on to say, iron sharpens iron. God bless you. It's a new beginning. Thanks again to everyone. Would you stand as we close in a word of prayer? Holy Father, we thank you for this evening and the privileged opportunity we share even through history to look back from whence we have come thank you for grace thank you for mercy Lord it's not so much from whence we come but the fact that we are here the question is what is our responsibility? What is the task confronting us? Yes, we stand on the shoulders of many. There are those who have given their lives that we could be where we are today. Help us not to take this for granted and to become selfish. Help us not to seek to live for comfort ourselves, but to be mindful of the purpose for which you have called us so that we can serve our cause as we go along from day to day. And how best than to keep our eyes on thee because it is as you have enlightened our path, brightened our way, that we'll be enabled, Lord, to discern between what is right from what is wrong. And we, may not, we will not have to be persuaded by those who choose the errant path. But as children of God, to stand for thee, whatever the cost may be. It is for this reason, Lord, that we seek enlightenment. That we seek to know the path that is right for us. Oh, will you continue to keep your hands upon your children? Oh, we thank you, Lord, for those who have stood up for thee. For those who are daring to raise the torch in spite of the cost, we ask your continued support and guidance. Thank you for this community, for our brothers and our sisters. Thank you for each year of this evening. And Lord, may we be a source of encouragement and inspiration to others even as we seek to bear the torch uh, so that others may be helped. Thank you for our presenter, our brother Norman and his family. You who know the nature of his journey. You who have heard his prayers. You who know the needs of the family. I commend the family to you and ask your continued ministering because, Lord, you are their health. You are their peace. You are their joy as with each and every one of us. It is to you that we look, not in the past, but steadfast ahead as we lift our sight to thee. Because it is by thy grace that we are where we are now. 
not the compassion of man, but your grace, your love. It is grace and grace alone. Again, we thank you. And we ask your continued blessing as we continue this program. Will you continue to give insight and guidance to those you have chosen uh, as leaders? Lord, thank you for the committee. Thank you for their effort. And we bless your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Don't stray. Go straight home. <laughs>